Good morning. The good news is the youth aren't going out. They're still here. Hooray. Brilliant. Good. Good news. How are we all doing? We all okay? Good. Don't tell me individually. That'll take too long. My name is um, Ali and I'm on the staff team here at Gas Street. And I am so pleased that we are kicking off this series on Colossians because you know what? It is a fantastic, fantastic book. It talks about prayer. It talks about Jesus. It talks about living out our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. So there really is nothing better at the start of this term, 2024 in Gas Street, than to be looking at this fantastic book of Colossians. But first of all, I'd like to talk to you about multivitamins. Multi, in fact, not just multivitamins, supplements of all variety. Supplements of all variety. I had a, a little rootle through our cup. Rootle, that's a good word as well, isn't it? I had a rootle through our cupboards this morning, and I came up with various vitamins. I came up with uh, some whey protein powder. We came up with some glucosamine. I have no idea what glucosamine even does, but it was there in my cupboards. My cupboards are full of all sorts of vitamins and supplements. Hands up if you ever take a supplement or a vitamin of any variety. Yes, loads of us. Apparently about half of the global population takes some kind of supplement every single day. It is a massive global business. Apparently a year or so ago, it was worth about $150 billion. It's really big business uh, worldwide. Now, the reason for that is that we have the feeling that what we're doing normally isn't quite enough. It's not quite enough. Our main and plain diets aren't enough. We need a bit of extra. We need some supplements. We need some add-ons. We need a little bit of editing going on to our diets. And as we look at the book of Colossians over the next few weeks, we're going to discover the same sort of idea, but the book of Colossians comes to the opposite conclusion, that a life of faith in Jesus Christ is all that is needed. Jesus Christ alone contains everything. You need to live your life. There's no supplements needed, no boosts, no extras, no add-ons. It's Jesus plus nothing. So let's start there with the book of Colossians. No supplements needed. It's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks is what it means to be devoted to and have our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. But before we kind of kick off this series, I'd love just to help us find some bearings a little bit with the book, because it's good to have a context to what Colossians is. What on earth is it? So the book of Colossians is, like a lot of the New Testament, a letter. And it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a small church in the town of Colossae, which is in what we know as modern-day Turkey. And uh, Paul the Apostle, after he encountered Jesus, he traveled around planting churches wherever he could. And when he planted them, he then went back to visit them, to challenge people, to encourage them, to keep going, to keep the faith, to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. But after a few years, Paul is put under house arrest and he's prevented from travel and traveling anywhere. And at that point, he thinks, well, what can I do? I still need to encourage people so he starts writing letters, and he writes letters to these new Christian communities all over the place. And that's what we have with the letter to the Colossians. The difference being, Paul didn't actually plant the church in Colossae. He'd planted a church about 100 miles away uh, in a town called Ephesus. And you might have heard of the book of the Ephesians, which is the letter to the people in Ephesus. And Paul had lived in Ephesus for about three years. And in that time, he'd made friends with a guy called Epaphras. And Epaphras had become a follower of Jesus. And it was Epaphras who took the gospel back to this small town of Colossae and planted the church there. So if you've tracked with Gas Street for a little while, it's a little bit like us planting St. Mark's Coventry back in 2017, and then St. Mark's going on to plant other churches, which it has done over the last few years. So the church in Colossae was planted in about 54 AD, so about 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. And about five or six years after it's planted, Paul is under house arrest. You can read about that incident in Acts 28 if you want to know what Paul was doing. But Epaphras comes to visit Paul. 
And Paul's like a mentor to him. So Paul wants to talk things through with him. He wants to tell him all the encouraging news of what's going on in this little church. But he also wants to talk through some things that are a bit more challenging, some of the issues going on. He wants to get Paul's take on it. And as Epaphras talks to Paul, Paul responds by writing this letter to be taken back to the church in Colossae. So that's what we're looking at over these next few weeks. And what do we find out in the letter about this little community? Well, this Colossian church is, by all accounts, doing pretty well. It's a few years old, and uh, Paul says in his letter that he's heard of their faith and their hope and their love. It's a great start, right? And then he's heard that they are bearing spiritual fruits, and he's heard that they are operating in the Holy Spirit and that they are loving one another. Some really, really great things going on as this little church has started. But as we all know, it's one thing to start well, it's another to keep going day by day. You'll probably know the Eugene Peterson quote, which says it's like a long obedience in the same direction. It's that journey of discipleship is not always as easy as we think it's going to be. Now, if you came to visit me in my house, you would look out through a window and you'd see my lawn and you'd think that lawn looks really nice and green. Ali's doing really well, keeping the grass great. But if you went out and had a little bit of a closer look, what you would discover is that actually there's not a lot of grass there after all. There's a lot of moss that has grown in across the whole lawn. All you dads out there are thinking, yeah, she needs a scarifier. That's what she needs. But I don't have one, not getting one, so there. But anyway, the grass looks nice and green, but if you get a bit closer, you'll realize it is mostly moss. The moss has been creeping in. And that's a bit of a problem, you see, because moss steals the water when it rains and it steals the nutrients, and it prevents the grass from getting any of those good things, and eventually it starts killing the grass off. But the thing about moss is it doesn't really have any roots. So when the sun comes out, and I've been promised it will this summer, when the sun comes out, I'll have massive great brown patches all over my lawn where the moss has died off. You don't want moss creeping in. And in this six-year-old church in Colossae, there was a danger of spiritual moss creeping in. Because you see, one of the things that Epaphras shares with Paul when he goes to meet him is that the church is being influenced by some teaching that is beginning to undermine their confidence in Jesus Christ. It's beginning to make them think that they need some supplements. They need some extra things, Jesus plus something. They're beginning to be taught that they need to take up some Jewish rituals, that they have to start worshipping angels, that they have to put certain strict demands on their bodies, that they have to have certain mystical experiences. And they were told that if these supplements weren't added, that they weren't really Christians after all. You know, that they weren't saved, that they couldn't know God. They were starting to believe that they needed Jesus plus something. And not surprisingly, Paul is pretty concerned by this news when Epaphras tells him this. And so he writes the letter and he says, hey guys, stick with the main and the plain. Don't get distracted. Don't get blown off course. Don't go down dead ends. You don't need it. You just need Jesus. Jesus is enough. And that's why this letter is absolutely relevant for us today, because we face our own version of these challenges and these temptations. You know, it's really easy for us to add in little extra rules and regulations with our faith. It's really easy for us to start to want to control what it looks like. It's really easy for us to get distracted. It's the curse of our generation, right? Distraction. The other thing we do is start looking for shortcuts or trying to make things a bit more exciting or a little bit less challenging. You know, what we do is start crafting our faith around us, around our culture, around our desires, not around Jesus and around his. So this letter to the Colossians is is short. It's only four chapters long, but it's got a powerful message. Christ is enough. No supplements needed. Okay, so we're going to jump into the reading, the little section for today, which is Colossians chapter 1, and it's verses 9 to 14. Uh, If you've got your Bible with you or it's up on the screen, uh, this is the NRSV version I'm reading from. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you. 
and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Now, when I was about 10 years old, <clears throat> I used to wear glasses. In fact, I still do wear glasses. I've just got contact lenses on today. I also had a particularly fetching bowl haircut. I don't know if anyone remembers the bowl haircut. It was a great look. Jess was asking if I had a photo of it earlier. No, there are definitely no photos anywhere of that. I also had asthma. And uh, for reasons best known to themselves, my parents had put me into school a year ahead of myself, a year early. So all to say, I was small, short-sighted, asthmatic, and very, very, very young for my year. And therefore, on PE days, on that horrible exercise they call team picking, let's just say I wasn't very often picked first. Do they still do team picking when they do that? Oh, it's horrible, isn't it? Horrible, horrible. So that kind of put me off team sports for life. I liked swimming, various things like that, but team sports, forget about it. However, in my household, my family absolutely love team sports. They play all sorts of things. Uh, the football is on constantly in our house. Completely randomly, my husband Nick came home yesterday with a Spain football top. I have no idea why. He is not Spanish, he doesn't support Spain, but he came home with a Spanish football top. You can ask him why later. No idea why. But today, I'd love to talk to you about football. But more specifically, I'd love to talk to you about that time of year called the transfer window. The transfer window. And you'll know what that is. But basically, it's the specific time of the year as a window in the season when one player can be transferred from one team to another. Deals are done, agents are involved, a transfer fee is paid, and everybody waits with bated breath to see who is going to be moved or what is going to be the impact on the game. And of course, for the players... It's a really massive deal because not only are they transferred to a new team, but they have a new manager and a new kit and a new playing style and new training exercises, a new club ethos. You know, for some of them, they have to move to a new country and learn a new language. You know, the transfer window is a huge moment of opportunity and hope and change. And this is what Paul is talking about in our passage today. We have been transferred from one kingdom, the power of darkness, to another, the kingdom of the beloved son. We have been transferred. And you know what? We saw it happen before our very eyes just last week in this building. In the baptisms, we saw 40 people transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Hallelujah. How incredible. It was an amazing time. Yeah, fantastic. You know, I, even looking at the photos this week on social media, I don't know if you've seen any of them, just the look on people's faces when they know what has happened in that transfer window, when they have been transferred to the kingdom of life. I still find it really, really moving every time. But of course, it wasn't just those 40 people, because if you're here and you'd call yourself a follower of Jesus, then you're going to have your own transfer window story. So what's your story? What was the deal that was done? How's the playing going? How are the training exercises? What does it look like for you now? You know, because it's not always easy, is it? Sometimes we start slipping back into our old habits from the old team. And of course, you might be here today and you haven't taken that transfer opportunity yet. But just to say, the window is open when you want to choose it. The window is open. And when we choose to follow Jesus, we don't just have a new team. We have a new manager. And the thing about this new manager that you need to know is that when you're transferred into his kingdom, you are out on the field of play straight away. You are out on the field of play. You know, I grew up in a Christian home. 
which is fantastic upbringing. But I kind of wandered away from church during my uni years. Now I'm like, oh, what a waste of time. What a waste of those years. But it's what happened. But eventually some friends brought me back into church. I encountered the Holy Spirit. And you know what? I was immediately out on the field of play. It was brilliant. I helped on some alpha courses. You heard the guys talking about alpha. You can get stuck in. I helped on an alpha course. I played in the worship team. And I got sent out on some mission trips with little groups of people going to different places to go and pray with people and talk to people about Jesus. You know, did I have incredible theological training at that point? No, absolutely not. Did I have my doctrine all in order? No, I really, really didn't. There was a great time when I was sent to jail, or I went to Germany with a team, and they taught us to say, komm heiliger Geist. Komm heiliger Geist. Anyone know what that means? Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. But that was it. I didn't know any other German at all. And my accent, I'm sure, is absolutely terrible. But with that little phrase, I got out there, thrown in at the deep end, laid my hand on people, prayed, come Holy Spirit. And you know what? The Holy Spirit came. And people were set free. And I saw people healed. And I saw people filled with the Spirit. And their lives changed. Out on the field of play, amazing. You know, I didn't have the training. In the world's terms, I had nothing. But I loved Jesus. I was full of the Holy Spirit. And I was out on the field of play of play. You know what? You haven't been transferred to sit and watch the game. You haven't been transferred even to sit in the changing rooms. You haven't been transferred to sit on the benches and you are not substituted off. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are out on the field of play. You know what? Even if you're injured, and many of us will carry injuries. In fact, probably most, if not all of us, carry injuries of one sort or another. The thing is about this team and this manager is that you still get to play. You still get to play. So today, I do want to remind anyone who feels like they are disqualified for whatever reason, you know, that you haven't played very well in the past, that you don't know what position you're in, that you're comparing yourself unfavorably with other players. It doesn't matter. The cross has qualified you, okay? The cross has qualified you. You are not counted out by Jesus, so don't count yourself out. And more than that, we need to be on the field of play. We need to be on the field of play. You know what it looks like when there's a game going on and someone gets sent off or someone gets injured. It has a big impact on the game. It makes it much harder for the other players. The game can take a downturn. You are needed to be on the field of play. So what is this field of play? Sounds a bit exhausting, doesn't it? <laughs> Running around for all that time. But the truth is, it's not exhausting. Religion is exhausting. But faith is not. Faith is not. You might have heard the term practicing your faith. Well, I'd like us to just turn that upside down and talk about faithing our practices. What is it that you do through the day? It doesn't really matter. But what matters is that you faith your practice. You invite Jesus in. You ask for his light to see what you are doing, who you are having conversations with. You can bring him into it and it will change everything that you are already doing. You see, Paul's prayer and encouragement to this church in Colossae is in verse 10. It says this, that they might lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. So that's the goal. That's the only goal, in fact, for each of us, whatever we are doing to live a life that pleases God. So what does your life look like, fully pleasing God? What would it look like? Where are the little moments that you can sense God's pleasure? Do you catch glimpses of it now again, like God being pleased with you? And if you're honest, do you know where the parts are that are not pleasing to him? How would you know about that? What would you do about it? Here's the goal. Living the rest of your life in a way that brings delight and pleasure to God. A life where he's drawn into it all that pleases him with your attitudes, your approaches to your everyday tasks, your conversations, your relationships, your finance, your moral character, your decisions, your focus, your household, your dreams, all of it. That there is not one part of our human existence that cannot be touched by the loving and liberating rule and reign of Jesus Christ. 
Because you see, it says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But with faith, all sorts of good things can start happening. Paul points out a few of them in our passage today in uh, verses 10 to 12. If you have a look at that in your Bible, he talks about bearing fruits in good works, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened in his power, enduring everything with patience, joyfully giving thanks. So I'd love to suggest that this is kind of our new ethos of the club with these words, fruitful, growing, stronger, resilient, joyful, thankful, You know, whatever you're doing with your life, whatever your day-to-day life looks like, this is what a life pleasing to God looks like. This is what it can look like. It's what we might start to expect seeing in our journey into discipleship. You know, if you feel a bit purposeless, feel like, ah, I don't really know what I'm doing with my life. This is the goal. Whatever you're doing, just press into this. If you're struggling with your identity, the big question, who am I really? This is who you can be. As you press into Jesus, as you fix your eyes on him, this is how we're growing. You know, it's what we should be encouraging one another in, challenging one another in, looking for signs of life in this. And you'll know, in fact, I can't remember if the guys mentioned, we have gastric communities starting in just a few weeks. When we start these, they're going to be small groups of, of Christians gathered together just to Look at the Bible to pray for one another. Do a bit of life together. But that is going to be a key tool for you pressing into your discipleship journey, joining a gastric community, because you are going to be really encouraged by other people praying for you, by talking through your faith with other people. And the thing is, you are going to be really key for them because you are going to encourage them and you are going to pray for them. It's like a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation. And and of course, who is our role model? Who's the name on the back of the shirt? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the one who did live a life fully pleasing to God in every single way. And you know what? You can read the stories about him in here. It's in the book. Jesus with his mother. Jesus with Herod. Jesus with Peter. Jesus with Mary. Jesus with Zacchaeus. Jesus with the disciples. You know, see what he did. See how he did it. See how he spoke. See how he conserved his energy. See how he spoke to the Father. It's Jesus and him alone. We can find a life fully pleasing to the Lord. So what is going to encourage us? What's going to encourage us as we step into this life pleasing to the Lord? Well, there are two things that Paul talks about at the start of the passage today. Firstly, prayer. He says he prays without ceasing. And secondly, being filled up, being filled with God's will and wisdom and presence and understanding in the Spirit. So first of all, prayer is absolutely crucial to our life of faith. You know, God loves us taking the initiative to pray. I don't know what that looks like. It might be a quick arrow prayer. On the way to work, it might be hours sort of sitting and soaking in his presence. I don't know how you pray. But the thing is, When we take the initiative to pray, God loves it because it means that we want to connect with him and God will come where he's wanted. Prayer is a sign that you want God. James 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. It is a promise. So why wouldn't we bring all of our hopes and concerns and fears and challenges of the day to him at the start of the day so we're ready to go? But more than that, Prayer is where we get to know who God is, who this new manager is, where we start to fix our eyes on him. Now, I'm told that there are two types of people in this world. There are PC people and there are Mac people. And you will know who you are. You will know who you are. And they say that whatever you start with, you go on with for the rest of your life. The first will always be the the best and will last through your life. So if you are an Apple iPhone person, you probably have always been an Apple iPhone person and vice versa. If you're a PC person, they are the first and the best. You are going to stick with them. Now, the psychologists have a beautiful term for this, and it's called baby duck syndrome. Oh, baby, little baby ducks. It's a good time of year to see baby ducks following the mother duck. And the reason it's called baby duck syndrome is because it's about a duckling 
learning how to follow its mother. You know, they go in those little rows behind the mother. How do they do that? Well, it's a process called imprinting, imprinting. And in the first, there's a little kind of section of the beginning of a duckling's life when it looks at its mother and it solidifies the image in its mind. And it looks at its siblings and it solidifies their image in its mind, which is exactly why it knows how to follow them and to stick as close as possible always. And the thing is, the scientists tell us that imprinting sometimes goes a little bit wrong and that a duck can imprint on the wrong thing, perhaps a, another animal, or um, sometimes even in, like an inanimate object like a ball, and it, it imprints onto them. And, and things go pretty badly wrong at that point because the bond with its mother disintegrates. And usually the little duckling is lost and it's unable to survive in the wild. Imprinting is really important. It's really crucial. You know, as we pray each day, it's like imprinting is taking you know, process in our minds. We're looking at Jesus. We're fixing him in our mind and in our heart. It's really important that we do that, that we are set, that we're ready to follow him through the day to stick as close as we can. And of course, Paul also talks about praying for the whole church. So I'd love to encourage you to think about who you are praying for and who's praying for you. Do you have people praying for you? Could you ask someone to pray for you? You know, you should have a prayer hit list. I think that's a good thing to do. Have 10 people on your prayer hit list. Tell them you are praying for them. You know, it's going to be so encouraging for them. Why wouldn't we do that for one another? You know, go to prayer and toast on a Tuesday morning. Come up here for some prayer ministry. There's people to pray for you. But whatever you do, do something. Get praying. And then secondly, we need to be filled we need to be filled. And the word Paul uses in this book of Colossians is, is a bit less like a glass being filled with water. And it's a little bit more about being controlled by something. So the way we might use the term filled with rage or filled with joy. You know, if you're filled with joy, you don't stand there and go, I am filled with joy. You don't do you. You jump up and down, you hug someone, you scream. When you're filled with joy, you are kind of taken over by it. It changes your behavior, it changes the words, it changes your tone. This is what Paul is praying for, for this new little church. They might be filled like this with the Holy Spirit, with God's presence. It is absolutely crucial because you see there is power available for us. Paul talks about the glorious power in Colossians. And this power is the same power we talked about last week about Jesus being raised from the dead. It is the same power and it's available for you and for me. We can be filled with that and the thing is, we're going to need it. You're going to need it. Because you know, the kingdom of darkness has not gone away. It is still out there. We still live in a broken world until Jesus Christ comes again. But because we've been transferred to a new team, not only do we kind of wear the kit of the team, but this kingdom of light is completely in us and through us. Did you know you are a glow-in-the-dark Christian? You're a glow-in-the-dark Christian because you carry the light in yourself. And because we carry the light, we can walk in dark places and not be afraid. It's because of that. We don't need to be intimidated. We don't need to be overwhelmed. We don't need to be exhausted. We are full of the kingdom of light. It's why it says in Psalm 23 that we can walk even in the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. Fear no evil. We're glow in the dark, Christians. As I come in to finish, perhaps the band can come on up. But I love the story that Anne Graham Lotz tells in her book, Just Give Me Jesus. Just Give Me Jesus. It's a story about her parents, Ruth and Billy Graham. You know, you'll know the evangelist. And uh, Ruth and Billy were at a VIP supper one night. And Ruth found herself sitting next to a man who specialized in financial fraud and in combating money laundering. And Ruth turned to him, being polite, and, and said to him, oh, well, you must spend a lot of your time studying fake banknotes. And the man turned to her and smiled and said, no, ma'am, I spend my whole time studying the real thing. That way I'll be sure to spot a fake. 
You know, my prayer for us as we go through this book of Colossians is that we will be studying the real thing. That we will be sure to spot a fake, whether it's in our own lives or around us. That we will absolutely keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We will keep the faith. We will keep going because we've been transferred to his kingdom. We've been transferred. You have been qualified and called and enabled and redeemed and paid for and forgiven. You know, you are good to go. The field of play is out there waiting for you. Amen. Amen. We're going to take communion together in a moment, but why don't I pray first? Do you want to uh, just stand if you're able? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are full of light, that you are perfect and beautiful. And Lord God, we thank you so much that you have transferred us into your kingdom, that we don't need to be afraid any longer, that the darkness has no power over us because we are in your kingdom and we are your children. We belong to you. So I pray now that you would come and fill us with your Holy Spirit that you would stir us again, that you would show us where our fields of play is, that you would be encouraging us back out there again, Lord God, that you'd fill us with your hope. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here, that we can keep our eyes fixed on you. And there's an old hymn, and it says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to focus on Jesus, what he did for us on the cross, how he qualified you and me. So there's going to be some words that are going to come up on the screen and we will say them together. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. So as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear son as we eat and drink these holy gifts. Make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. So with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Let's just take a moment for ourselves. If there's something on your mind, your heart, just confess it to Jesus quietly now. Thank you, Jesus, that you draw close to us when we draw close to you. Thank you that you love us and you forgive us and you make us clean and ready to come to your table again. Amen. 
And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from So we break this bread to share in the body of Christ. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We're going to take communion now. There will be uh, sort of three stations here at the front and one at the back. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you are welcome to come to the table and take the bread and wine. And the way we do it, if you hold out your hand, someone will drop a wafer in your hand and then you can dip it in the wine and then consume it. And if you need gluten-free wafers, please come to the front and and ask the person and they will be able to make sure you have gluten-free wafer. But if you come forward as the Hello and Welcome team, I invite you.